Who was Ham, generation 11 of mankind? Let's use the periodic table of history and some maps to explore this question. We can go in here to the periodic table of history and see our 6,000 years of history. I'm over here in the United States. You might be over here in China or India or the Middle East, or you might even be over in the United Kingdom or Ireland. What we're going to do is travel over to Israel and then go back in time and meet up with Ham. So let's go in here and look at who was Ham. I extrapolated his lifespan from the life of Shem, thinking that their genetics would be similar. Now Shem lived from 2560 BC to 1958 BC, or some approximate number in that time frame. Shem, Ham, and Japheth are all brothers, and there are their life bars. When we look on the grand scheme of things, they lived an awful long time, all the way into 2000 BC. We can see they lived through one of the most interesting times in human history, even up through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There's Isaac and then Jacob here. And that would have been past Ishmael and everybody also. That's what the brothers look like on the scope of time. They were born about right here. The flood happened in the middle of the circle about right here. And Ham died in the middle of the circle right around here. Now Ham had access to all the technology of the pre-flood world. He probably knew how to make special machines, special weapons, anything that had been developed in the pre-flood world, all the technologies. Uh, he lived through the worldwide flood, and then he lived to see the post-flood civilization so Ham and his wife were one of the four most prominent couples in the world before 2000 BC. And so what do we know about Ham and how did his family spread into the world? In Genesis 6, 9, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God and Noah begat three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. You can read about the great flood of Noah in many cultures. Noah and his family ended up on the mountains of Ararat. So let's go take a look at the mountains of Ararat. Well, here we are. If we look out the mountains of Ararat, this is what we would see. Mountains in the north. Then we look towards the Mediterranean, and then we can look towards the south and the Persian Gulf. What would you have been thinking after the flood? How would you feel when you looked out across the mountain systems having no knowledge of anything and nobody to ask? In Genesis 8.15, the text states, and God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife and thy sons and thy sons' wives with thee. So Ham's first sight would have been something like this. In my Shem and Japheth video, I spoke of how I would have liked to explore this area. And the first three things I would have explored would have been the Euphrates, then the Tigris, and then the Mirat River that leads out towards the Mediterranean Sea. After these, I'd be curious about the Black Sea and finally the Caspian Sea. And we can see that Japheth gets the closest cut of the earth close to Mount Ararat, since he's in the north and gets the area around the Black Sea and Caspian Sea. Most of Shem's sons end up getting the Middle East, the Fertile Crescent type kind of area. And then you can see Ham estranged from Noah, so it makes sense that Ham ends up farther away from Mount Ararat. So let's start with what we know after the flood, and then let's see where Ham's sons end up. Here's where Shem's sons end up. Here's where Japheth's son ends up. And then we'll explore Ham in this video. The Jewish Seder Hadarat writes about Noah watching some goats munch on some grapes and becoming bouncy and happy. The same phenomena happens with bears that eat apples. The apples ferment in the bear's stomach and they get drunk. So in the Greek version of the flood, Noah's wife gets out of the ark and understands that all her friends are dead, so she commits suicide. If the story is correct, that leaves Noah 
on his own. Now the lake closest to Mount Ararat is called Lake Seven. Even though there's eight in the family, the lake isn't called Lake Eight. It's called Lake Seven. So if Noah's wife committed suicide, this lake may have been a commemoration of the event. 38 miles from Lake Seven is the oldest wine press in the world. This wine press happens to be 52 miles from Mount Ararat, and it is also one of the top sites I would have explored after the flood. I said in the Japheth video that as a hiker I would go into the basin area north of Ararat and explore two riverways that lead up to Lake Seven. The caves of Arini have the oldest wine press in the world and happen to be beside one of those riverways. The wine press idea adds weight to the argument that Noah explored this area. It is amazing to start adding up the coincidences in the Hebrew record. So we look at the coincidence of the oldest wine press in the world being in one of the most probable migration systems of Noah. Uh, the Hebrew record explains that Noah got drunk and his nakedness was exposed to Ham. So if you look close to the Hebrew language, it is apparent that Noah, while drunk, got raped by his son Ham. So the caves of Arini may have been the site of this event. Now Japheth gets a geographic blessing, Shem gets a spiritual blessing, Ham doesn't get a blessing, and Canaan, one of Ham's sons, gets a curse. The time of this event is sometime from 2460 BC to 2110 BC, because that's the lifespan of Noah after the flood. Now, in the same time span, there is a valley area to the southeast of Ararat leading to Lake Ermia. Following this system, one can end up getting to none other than the Tower of Babel. You can see how if you are a hiker exploring this area with no other maps or anything to guide you, how you could end up going through these river systems and end up at the Tower of Babel. When we link that information up with our idea of the Tigris and Euphrates running out right here, here's the Tigris, here's the Euphrates, we can see how this would be one of the major geographical areas after the flood. The original family had Mount Ararat as a common meeting place. The Japhethites had Mount Olympus as a common meeting place. Shem and Ham seemed to have the plain of Shinar between the Tigris and Euphrates River as a common meeting place. And we can see why this would be a major intersection of the old world right after the flood. Now the Tower of Babel in Iraq is a monument established by Nimrod, son of Ham. So if we start to integrate the Hebrew record with the Babylonian and Akkadian records, we find a set of the oldest cities on the planet. In a humorous way, I like to think of the cities as the three little pigs cities. If they had trouble at one city, they could run into the other city, so on and so forth. So these are the cities on the Sumerian kings list. The first one is Kish. The second one is Uruk, it's where Gilgamesh was. Third is Ur, and we recognize Ur because that's where Abraham was from, Ur of the Chaldees. The Chaldeans were descendants of Arphaxad. So anyway, I think of these cities as being at close proximity together. If you had trouble at one city, you could run over to the other cities. And at first, these would just be tent sites. Genesis 11.1 1 states, And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech, and it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick, and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and tower, whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. In the text, since the land of Shinar was already named, the Euphrates and the Tigris and the plain of Babylon were already discovered. Since they journeyed from the east, they were probably making another exploratory pass using Lake Ermia and the Sirwan River. Now, I don't know if Noah is here, 
but the land between Euphrates and Tigris is laden with Shemitic and Hamitic cities. So as far as the population, we can think of the population generation 10. We have one male named Noah, generation 10. Then we go to three males named Shem, Ham, and Japheth. That's in generation 11. Then we have 16 males, generation 12, 33 males in generation 13. And Nimrod is one of the generation 13. Now, it probably took a little bit of time for him to grow up before he could bully one around. But he does grow up, and we read he becomes a tyrant of tyrants. Keep in mind the generations from 10 to 14 lived longer than 400 years. So the long lifespans here really give historians a run for their money. In this era, there are long, middle, and short chronologies because historians cannot figure out what's going on with the lifespans. You can see these long lifespans over here. Uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth would have lived past their children, 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 children's lifespan. Now back in Genesis, and the Lord came down to see the city and the tower, which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of the city called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. I mean, God, who wants everybody to go out and repopulate the earth, replenish the earth, spread out, uh, then all the people decide, let's just stick together. The confounding of languages is not just a Genesis record. It's found in many ancient cultures. In Genesis 10.6, we read, And the sons of Ham, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Now, if we go to Josephus, we can get a 2,000-year-old glimpse of where the children of Ham ended up. The children of Ham possessed the land from Syria and Ammonus and the mountains of Libanus, seizing upon all that was on its seacoast and as far as the ocean, and keeping it as their own. Some indeed of its names are utterly vanished away. Others of them being changed, and another sound given them, are hardly to be discovered. Yet a few there are which have kept their denominations entire. For of the four sons of Ham, time has not at all hurt the name of Cush, for the Ethiopians over whom he reigned, or even at this day, both by themselves and by all men in Asia, called Cushites. The memory also of the Mizraites is preserved in their name. For all we who inhabit this country of Judea, called Egypt, Mestre, and the Egyptians, Mestrians. Phut also is found in Libya, and called the inhabitants Phutites from himself. There is also a river in the country of Moors which bears that name. Whence it is that we may see the greatest part of the Grecian histiographers mention that river and the adjoining country by the appellation of Phut. But the name it has now has been changed, given it from one of these sons of Mizraim, who was called Libios. We will inform you presently what has been the occasion why it has been called Africa also. Canaan, the fourth son Ham, inhabited the country now called Judea, and called it from his own name, Canaan. So with Genesis, Josephus, and modern history, we get to piece together the geography of the sons of Shem. So we can see the timeline of the countries of the north. We also have the timeline in the south, and this is the timeline of Egypt and then Ham also, because Ham is here. You can see their lifespan extrapolated from the life of Shem, 602 years. And his descendants are here, Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. So here we see Cush starting out in the upper Nile region. And we see Mizraim right in the heart of Egypt, Put, and Libya not too far from Egypt, 
It's not the present-day Libya that we think of. It's Libya really close to Egypt. And then Canaan, called Judea. So we can already see how this is going to shake out. With Shem being at Jerusalem from the book of Jasher. And then we have Canaan settling right here. On our timeline of the southern countries, we see Cush right here. In Egyptian hieroglyphics, Cush with a C is spelled Cush with a K, and the first city on the Sumerian kings list is Kish. See, we can go up into the Sumerian kings list and see this city here. And we know that Nimrod is a son of Ham that instigated the Tower of Babel. Kish is not very far from there. So this might have been the initial spread out area after the confusion at the Tower of Babel. And then people would have spread out even farther. So just like Japheth dispersing the land around the Black Sea, the Hamites could divide the land around the Red Sea. They also could have easily just gone around the Fertile Crescent into Egypt and then traveled up the Nile and ended up in this high area of the Nile and then eventually followed the river system down in into Ethiopia and into this area where Kenya is. We can see on the timeline that Egypt is here and Cush is here, and every once in a while their history interlinks. The first king of Cush is Awawa, who conquers parts of Egypt. So even though Egypt is the gatekeeper of wealth between the Japhethites, Shemites, Africa itself is a rich continent that starts to develop great wealth despite Egypt. On the Ugartic inscriptions, Mizraim is MSRM. On the Amarna text, it is Mizri, M-I-S-R-I. -S the Assyrians called Egypt Musur, M-U-S-U-R. Babylonians called Egypt Musri. Ugartic inscriptions are accounting for letters passed between the kings of the Middle East. The Amarna text of Syria have some epic stories of Baal worship. These are similar to the Japhethetic Mount Olympus myths that show the little G gods dwelling among people. I still get the picture that the ancient ones like Noah, generation 10, and generation 11, 12, 13, and 14 were all still living over 400 years. And I can see the reason for why stories were developed that worshipped ancestors as gods. See, Nimrod was 13th generation. And it can explain why such colossal sites such as the Tower of Babel were constructed. They had such technologies and such long lifespans. So a point of note is that little g gods kill each other with special weapons and special technologies. So they are not real gods, like they are not the real one true god, as I think. But using what we know from the Bible, I think it is much more likely people like Nimrod and the folklore gods like Baal are 11th to 14th generation humans that knew a lot more than the weak humans that only lived less than 100 years. The Baal and Zeus type gods are constantly bargaining technology, weapons, armor, pharmaceutical potions, and sex with humans. So the 100 year humans seem to think that mating with a 400-year human is a great prize. And they then call their descendants half-god, half-human. See, it just makes sense that the 100-year humans were worshiping the 400-year humans. They would not even have seen them die because the 400-year humans just kept on living. In my religion, we are absolutely not to worship any created thing as God since there is only one true God. And at any time we make something to be a supposed little g god, we become slaves. You can see this mechanism over and over and over again. So this is exactly what happens to the people worshiping Nimrod and Baal, or Baal. See, in Deuteronomy 5, 6, Genesis states, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Thou shalt have none other gods before me. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness 
of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth, thou shalt not bow down thyself unto them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. So here we see this genealogy. Now look, if we see the lifespan of Adam, he lived 930 years, and right after he dies, writing is developed. I find that another coincidence of the Bible that people don't even know what death is until it happens, and after it happens, they see the need of passing information on, and so they develop writing. And so we can see that. We can see that writing is developed right around 3000 BC, and that's even in the pre-flood world. Now in the timeline, we have the first king of, of Egypt as being Menes, and that's around 3000 BC. So there is confusion to me about how this really interlocks because the flood happens about right here. And so there's some confusion to me as to why there are dynasty bars behind where the flood is. But what's curious to me is when we look for the other histories, like the histories of Libya, I think some of these dynasties of foot got incorrectly integrated into Egypt and they're making the Egyptian timeline go a little bit older than it should be. You can ask one Egyptologist, were the Israelites in Egypt? And they'll say, no, never. And you'll ask another one and they say, yes, absolutely. So I think that this timeline of Egypt isn't as solid as people think that it might be. And it's a point of contention. Therefore, it's a point where you have to choose to believe one way or another. Do we believe that Egypt's history is this old? If it is this old, it's going past the flood into the pre-flood world. That would make the pyramids of Egypt the oldest structures in the world and structures that survived the flood. I have a hard time believing anything can survive the flood because the earth is practically ripped in half. And so I wonder if there's a problem with the timeline here. But to me, I just have to guess and have faith that the Hebrew record is still correct. And then I go on faith that there may be something wrong with the Egyptian record. Not quite sure, but I think it deserves study. And if you want to, leave comments about this in the comment section. I am very curious to hear your thoughts. Because when I was doing the study of Africa, it was hard to get at information when you talked about Cush and Put. We can look in here and see some gaps. We can see some long reigns. I mean, look at this, 2000 BC to 1850 BC. That's somebody that, that reigned for 150 years. But right after that, we don't really see what's going on here. See, there's a gap, there's, there's missing information. And we don't really start getting to see a lot of information about Cush until we, until we get a little bit later. So we have missing information there. We also have missing information when, when we go to Libya. And so I think they were so closely related to Egypt that they got integrated incorrectly into the timeline of Egypt and made it a little longer than it should be. Anyway, the, but this is the biblical record. This is how the biblical record would shake out the lifespan of Ham. And then you see the lifespans of the sons. Remember, these guys are living 400 years. And, and then their sons are over here. So we have three sons here on the timeline. That would be Cush, Mizram, and Phut. And then we remember that Canaan integrated himself right here, right overlapping Israel. See, his time bar would come down here because Syria is where Canaan ended up. And we would go, when we go all the way back along the timeline, we can see that it's a little bit broken also, but we also know that it's integrated into the timeline of Israel. As far as time goes, here are the time errors where the four sons of Ham shake out. One, two, three, and four. 
And then as far as geography, we can see them here, one, two, three, and four. And look at that train wreck that's about to happen between Shem and Canaan. Foot is Libya, and the descendants of Foot spread out into where the Moors are. So this land was known by Darius the Great. It's also written in different forms by the Babylonians as Putta, and in Old Persian as Putriya. And in Genesis 12, Abraham journeys to the area that is present-day Jerusalem. So the city of Shem is mentioned in the book of Jasher as being founded by Melchizedek, who is also thought to be Shem. And then we have Canaan setting up next to him. And Abraham, remember he's of Ur. So when we get back to this other picture, we see the city of Ur here. Abraham goes up to Haran, which makes sense because this is the land of Arphaxad and the Shemites. And then Abraham goes down into this area. In Genesis 12, Abraham journeys to the area of present-day Jerusalem. And the Lord appears to Abraham, promises the land to Abraham. So Abraham eventually sets up on the mountain regions, while Canaan sets up in the valley beside the Mediterranean Sea. We all know what happens next because we have gotten to hear about the endless wars in the Middle East since then. Evolutionists say this area is the oldest area on the planet. I think that is due to the prejudices that have been exported by the English. And it's unfortunate because if you look at the biblical model, everything is so elegant. When you look at geography, when you look at logic, when you think about your own survival, what you would do when you got off the ark. And when I look at these trade areas and when I look at where I would have explored, I would definitely have ended up at the Tower of Babel. I mean, it's no wonder that the oldest cities in the world are right here on the plain of Shinar. And the Sumerian kings list lists all these cities that are some of the oldest cities in the world. And then when you see that an event happened like the Tower of Babel, and many cultures speak of this Tower of Babel event that spread everybody to all ends of the earth, then you can see where the sons of Japheth went. They went up here in the north. It's so logical. And you can look at the other video on the sons of Japheth. Now, you can see where the, the sons of Shem went. And you can look on another video for that. And you can see how logical it is. When you see that there's an event that estranges Ham from Shem and Japheth, you can see why Ham is almost expelled as far away from Noah as he can possibly get. And then you can see why the children of Ham set up where they did. Going along the oceans would lend somebody over into Libya. I mean, this is a very logical way. Uh, if you saw the, the richness of the Nile, it's very apparent that, that someone would want to go along the Nile. When we change our perspective of where Ham went, it's very apparent why Put went over onto the Mediterranean and how that was good access to the Greeks and how Mizraim had a tower of an area where he could control all the wealth in Africa and trade it with the Shemites and the Japhethites up here. And then you can... You can just see why somebody would be so curious about this river and trying to explore it and end up in the, the upper Nile. And if you got up this far, wouldn't one of your kids just keep going? You keep going and you find this land that is some of the richest land on the planet. I mean, it makes absolute sense to me. And so it's no curiosity that things happened the way they did. It's no curiosity that the model in the Bible is so incredible to me. And the more I look at it, the more I believe it. And of course, it puts me in conflict with the evolutionists. But as a chemist and studying the evolution hypothesis for decades, I have never found anything to convince me. As soon as I think I'm convinced of evolution, I look a little deeper and find out that somebody guessed something into an equation that I can't accept, and the whole thing crumbles before me. So when I see this model of what history says about the world and how it developed and how it spread out, 
and then I see our modern systems and I'm able to extrapolate back, I am blown away by the understanding and all the connections that I can make. The caves of Arenci uh, just happen to be the oldest wine press in the world, right there where Noah is. Lake Seven, it's right there. Why is it Lake Seven? Uh, why is Ur called what it is? Is there really a such thing as Ur? Is there really a Gilgamesh? Well, we have the Epic of Gilgamesh. Is there really somebody named Nimrod? Well, then you go talk to the people in Saudi Arabia, and everybody knows about Nimrod. Would people have settled out in this area where they're looking out across the plain and they see these river systems? And would, would this be an inviting area to settle in where the Tigris and Euphrates is? Yes, it would be an awesome place to settle in. So I look at the biblical model and I'm blown away and I love it. And hopefully this video has allowed you to understand some connections and piece together some curiosities that you've wondered about. When you get some free time, please read Genesis chapter 9 through 11 and think about how you would feel and cope in this new world. And what do you think about the pyramids? Were they made pre-flood or post-flood? Please leave some comments in the comment section. I'd love to hear your thoughts there. So we see that Adam is linked to Ham, linked to Mizraim, who's linked to our modern history. And I hope this helps you understand how modern history and ancient history come together. Well, I thank you for watching. It's always free to subscribe, share, thumbs up, and comment. So have a great week, and I will see you in the next video.